give it back to you. We offer it up to you as a sacrifice of worship. You, even our very breath, everything that we are, every fiber of our being, that we want that to be used for you and for your mission. God, I pray that this morning as we open your, your word that we would just be listening with open ears, open hearts, and open minds um, and ready to hear what you have for us this morning. Pray this in your sense. Amen. Thank you, guys. Anyone here ever trying to communicate truth to children? How's that work for you? Pretty effective? Again, whenever I'm trying to communicate ideas to, to my kids, something always happens. They always ask me that evil question. You know what that question is? Why? Why? Right? You're trying to communicate them truth. You're trying to help them. In fact, often, almost exclusively, other than when I tell them they should run my back, almost exclusively when I tell them something, it's for their benefit. But inevitably, they want to ask me that question. Why? Hey, Peyton, don't touch the fire. Right? But Dad, it, it's cool. It draws you in. It's got these really cool colors, and it's orange and red, and a little blue flame. I'm like, Peyton, that's bad. And I even see it in her eyes. She's not even talking, and I can see her eyes. She's like, why? I'm like, because it's hot. Because it's going to burn you. And inevitably, we need to know the why in life. And one of the fun things is now when I tell Peyton not to touch something, you know what she does? So I told her not to touch a toy the other day because the boys were playing with it. You know what she said? It's hot. <laughs> so she got the why, right? She got the why. If you touch it, it will bring you pain. Maybe it will burn you. Maybe the kids will beat you. <laughs> right? And I think this morning, Paul is talking to us as spiritual children in the book of Ephesians. We're in chapter 5. We're kind of wrapping up what I would consider chapter 5. If you need a Bible, just raise your hand. Eric's walking around with them. We'd love to give you one as a gift this morning to loan or even to steal. It's a gift, so you can't steal it. But turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5, because here's what Paul's telling us. He's telling us this. When we get truth, even at a young age, we are convinced that truth demands recognition acceptance and change. So when I'm telling Peyton, don't touch that burner on the stove, and she's looking at me with those butterfly eyes, I want to think about Paul. Because here's what I think Paul is telling us. Paul is simply saying this. He wants us as spiritual children to pay attention. What he's going to tell us matters. So he says, pay attention. And he's made it very clear that the church is actually God's master plan to display his love to the world. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10 makes that so clear. And here's what he's been telling us since that verse. Therefore, be careful to how you live. Pay attention. Pay close attention. Pay attention to things close by. Pay attention to the important things, things that have an eternal impact. And I'm fairly convinced that many of us struggle with this. Call it ADD. Call it whatever you want. We have a hard time focusing. We have a hard time paying attention to what matters most. And the proof is actually in our schedules. So we spend our time and our talent and our treasure. And Paul wants to say, don't settle for less. This matters. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5 and follow me. I'm on page 838 of our church Bibles here. Verse 15 says this. Look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. Make the very best use of your time, because the days are what, church? Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, even if you can't sing. This isn't about being tone deaf and making a melody to the Lord in your heart, giving thanks always for everything in God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting then to one another out of reverence for Christ. Father God, as we open this word, I pray that you speak to us, and I pray that you speak through us. Bind my words from things that will be distracting that won't help us to pay attention, but rather allow me to be precise and to point people towards what Paul's trying to say so that we might actually live differently. Give us truth this morning and may we recognize it, accept it, and for some of us, may we change. For some of us, may we not touch the burner. May we start to recognize what is hot and what is not and what you've actually called us to, what your will is. And may you be glorified in each step of the way. And all of his people said... Amen. I think there's three real commands that Paul's going to give us this morning in the text. If you have your sermon notes, you can pull them out there in the worship folders in front of you and, and follow along with me if, if you'd like. The first one's about walking. Remember last week, the verse we ended with? 
verse 14, wake up. Arise, O sleeper, wake up. The time change has already happened. Anyone still struggling with the time change or just me? It's still struggling, right? He says, get up, wake up. You were dead, now you're alive, so walk. And the way in which we walk matters. Remember, walk is just the manner of your life. He says, pay attention. He's used the word walk more than any other description in the book of Ephesians so far. Here's just some of them. Walk in a manner that's worthy. He says, look, are you walking worthy? Are you walking humbly in unity, separated from the world, not settling for lesser joys? Are you imitating Christ? Are you imitating him in love? Are you imitating him in light? When you walk around, are you the light of the world or are we settling for less? And he literally says this, look, observe, pay attention, focus. That's what he says here in verse 15. Look carefully, you were in darkness. Now you can see things that you never saw before. You see actions in your life and you identify them as darkness and you say, man. Anyone here when they're walking with Christ, they start to realize how they, they can be a bum sometimes? Am I the only one that recognized that in my life? The more God turns on the light, the more I recognize the darkness that's in my heart that I need to be saved from. So Paul says, look, examine, pay attention. Maybe this week you did something and you looked at your life and you go, gosh darn it, I am a sinner. Guess what? You are. But God. But God saw you in that darkness and he brought you to light and he gave you life. And the question Paul's asking is, are we living in light? Here's what the verse says back in Romans chapter one, we looked at last week. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and in their foolish hearts, they were what? Darkened. The lights were off, claiming to be wise, they became fools. Even Timothy, when Paul's writing in 2 Timothy chapter three, verse seven, he says this, fools are always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of truth. How do we get the knowledge of truth? But God, that's it. So Christians are never arrogant in their righteousness. First of all, we're never righteous apart from God. And second of all, in any righteousness we have, we recognize the grace of God. We recognize that he turned the lights on. And now, even as we walk, we still stumble. We still mess up. We still make mistakes. It's why I think we shouldn't just do communion every so often. I think we should do it every day. The problem is, what would we do? We would make it a ritual. We would lose the significance. So Paul says in Romans, and he reminds us that we were fools. Matthew, Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 7, verse 14. He says this, brothers, sisters, the gate is narrow. The gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. Make sure you pay attention if you're on it. Make sure you're walking that hard and narrow path. Make sure you're paying attention to how you walk. So he starts this way. He says this, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but how? As wise. We're going to contrast. He contrasted light and darkness last week. We're going to have a bunch of contrasting statements this morning. The first one is this, walk as men and women who are wise, not unwise. Now, what does that look like? He tells us a little bit here. He describes, he says this, making the most of what? Okay, church, it's that audience participation point. What are we making the most of? Time. What time? Sunday mornings? What time are we to make the most of? All of our time. He says this, making the best use of the time, not as unwise because the days are evil, so don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. The question for us this morning that Paul's asking is, are we being wise with our time? You know, if I had a dollar for every single time that someone came to me and said, hey, pay attention, this season with Peyton is going to go really fast. Peyton's my youngest. I've got an eight-year-old and a five-year-old. You think I don't know how fast it goes? I blink and they're eight years old. Some of you are like, no, I blink and they're 28 years old. They're 48 years old. It goes fast. Here's the word that Paul uses when he says make the most of the time. He's literally saying to ransom, to buy it back or out of. He says, I want you to understand how important time is. Now, when Paul says the word time in the Greek, he doesn't use the term chronos, which is this word for a fixed amount of time or clock. That's what chronos means. Rather, he uses the word kairos, which is a measured set of time. It's a season. How long will Peyton be one? Trick question, right? It's not. How long will Peyton be one? One year. We on the same page? 
How quick will it go by? One year, and it goes faster than it feels. You've got this segment of time, this measured allotment, and here's what that's what Paul's saying. Don't be unwise, but be wise, making the best use of whatever time that you have. Your time is fixed. These guys, I, I'm a workaholic. Now, part of it is because I love to work, and I love what I do, and I could work long and hard and all day, every day. These guys that are workaholics, we have conversation. We say, why do we do that? Part of it's bad theology. That's probably the core of it. But do we understand that time is limited? You can always go make more money. I don't know if you're talented and actually can make more money. But there's always more opportunities to make money. But you don't have more than the season that you've been given right now. Here's Paul's heart. He says, church, be careful how you walk. The way in which you walk has eternal ramifications and I've given you as God a set a season and a set amount of time. Vintage grace will only be at one service for so long because then we'll be at two. And we'll do special service where one service will be fun, it'll be great, but it's a season. It's a season and Paul is saying, make the best use of your time. Ransom it. Now the difficulty that I have with this passage is for as many people have told me, hey Drew, really enjoy, and it could be any season of life. When Jen and I were engaged, we had a young couple that just got engaged. When you're engaged, right, you have this idea of really enjoy your engagement because afterwards you're married. <laughs> or you're on your honeymoon, right? Really enjoy your honeymoon because after the honeymoon is what? Work. And marriage is work. And I got to tell you, I have so much fun doing marriage. I have so much fun doing work. But everyone's always telling me, hey, this is going to go away soon. And you know what I tell them? When it goes away, what else will be there? Something else. A new season. A new time. A new opportunity. And right now, I think Paul is saying, be careful how you walk. Make the best use of your time. But how often does someone come and challenge us? Hey, did you take advantage of Sunday morning at Vintage Grace this week? Did you get ready for it? Did you prepare for it? Did you prepare your heart? Now, I know that means you got in front of the mirror and you did your makeup. I get that. But I had someone invite me out to Saturday night, and I was going to be gone to about one in the morning on a Saturday night, and I said no. And they said, why? I said, because I'm getting ready for Sunday morning. Because that's a season of time that's sacred for me, and I'm preparing for that. In the same way, are you looking at your walk with God, understanding that there are moments and seasons and opportunities that are for the taking for you to get to know him better? Don't waste them. And it's not just Sunday mornings. It's life group. It's the coffee shop. It's, it's sitting in the car. And instead of listening to the next radio station, I'm a huge fan of radio stations. But instead of listening to the next radio station, maybe take a moment to be silent, to be still, to clear your brain, to say, God, I want to listen to you. I want to receive. Paul says this, make the most of your time. Redeem your time. And this applies to every area of our life, our time with worship, our time with friends. When you're with people, be with them. Because that's a season. Because that's a moment. Don't be ADD. Don't multitask. I'm starting to be convinced that no one can multitask well. I know I can't. And I want to project my weaknesses on you. But when I'm with you, whether it's God or my wife or my friends or my family, Paul says, make the best use of your time. Be present. That's wisdom. Don't be unwise. Be wise. He continues on and he says this. Why does he tell us to be wise? Why does he tell us? Because the days are evil. He says, be wise because the days are evil. Now, when I think of the days being evil, the best description I can give you is actually my five-year-old this week. We turned on Good Morning America, and Carson said, do we have to watch the news today? It's always bad news. You ever get that sense sometimes? Do we have to watch the news today? It's always bad news. And my five-year-old says, I don't want to watch GMA. Now, I watch GMA because I think they do a better job at actually watching good news and celebrating good things. But he recognizes that the days are evil. I remember a guy came to my office years ago and he says, Drew, I wish God, you preach that God's in control. You preach that God is sovereign. I wish God would do something about all the evil in the world. Anyone ever said that statement? I have. Shake your hand at God frustrated, angry, fallen world, messed up marriages, miscarriages, infertility, Down syndrome, all sorts of things that are a result of being in a fallen world. Divorce, settling for less, workaholism, arrogance, pride, 
settling for money and thinking that that will make you happy. People that don't have water, people that don't have food, the list goes on and on and on. Cancer. You ever shaking your hand to God? I sat with this man and he was frustrated. I was able to affirm his frustration. I, I, I've, I've prayed those prayers. But I said, you know what, brother? I think God did do something. He put you here to do something about it. Remember what he said in Ephesians chapter five, verse one? Oh, what does Paul tell us to do in Ephesians five, verse one? Be like what? Imitators of God. Could you imagine if we lived as imitators of God making the most use of our time? Could you imagine if the church became what I think God intends it to be? The place for the people who are sick. The place for the people where their marriages are broken to come to and say, I need restoration, I need help. The place where those who struggle with alcohol and sex addiction could come and say, help me, I'm drowning and I recognize that this actually won't make me happy. See, I do think that God did something about it. I think he created the church. He created us to be the living proof of a loving God. So Paul says this, make the best use of your time because the days are evil and the opportunities will be rampant and they will be everywhere. Just in the last couple months in our community, has anyone recognized that the days are evil? Anyone seen that? I did three funerals a couple weeks ago, all in a five-day stretch period of time, all under the age of 47. Heart attack, drugs, cancer. You think the days are evil? Guys, our time is allotted, our time is short. The incident at 36 Handles just happened. We just had a Jackson dad pass away unexpectedly. We had a Cameron Park shooting just last week. House to set ablaze. Are the days evil in El Dorado Hills? Okay, for those of you that aren't with me yet, are the days evil? Yeah. Which means the opportunities are great. The days are evil, the opportunities are great because we start to recognize that drugs and sex and a bigger home isn't going to give us more time and it's actually not going to make us more happy. What will make us more happy? Being dead and then being alive, having a relationship with Christ. And you know what brought me a ton of joy? As I see the evil in this world, it's seeing you as the church be the difference. It's seeing you as the church say, hey, you know what? We're going to gather at school to have a prayer meeting at Jackson School. It's seeing you as the church say, you know, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, but I live in Cameron Park and I saw these fires and I can't sleep. And instead of saying I can't sleep, Tony's saying, what can I do about it? It's the Tonys of the world that are saying, you know, someone should do something about this. And then she's like, no, I don't say that. I just say, what can I do about this? You see the difference? Instead of yelling at God, and here's what I love when we yell at God. What does God do to us? He hugs us. He whispers. He says, I love you. Let's do this together. I didn't put you in that Cameron Park neighborhood stack poles on accident. That was on purpose. You don't go to Jackson School because you bought a house there. You go there because God put you there. You go there to be the living proof of a loving God. That's the calling of vintage grace. That's the calling of Ephesians 3.10, that we would live and love like Jesus. So therefore, Paul says, don't be foolish. Don't not recognize the sovereignty of God in your home purchase. Understand that God is putting you there. Understand that you are a light. And here when he says foolish, I think really what Paul's saying is don't care about foolish things. Anyone here care about foolish things? Who yelled at the TV during March Madness? Was I the only one? <laughs> Who yelled at the Little League game? Was I the only one? Man! I can be a fool! I can miss it! And that's why Paul's saying, be careful, pay attention. Brothers, sisters, don't miss this. Therefore, do not be foolish. Pay attention to what matters most. It wasn't that your kid struck out. It's that your kid feels loved by you and knows that he's loved by God. That's what matters most. And we have a tendency to be forgetful and foolish people. So Paul says, don't. Don't be foolish. Now he's contrasting this with wisdom. Now I love this. In Paul's day, you know who was really celebrated in Paul's day? Because we celebrate athletes nowadays. Were athletes celebrated in Paul's day? Kind of, right? The Colosseum, they had all this stuff. But were they celebrated for long periods of time? No, why? Because why? they died in the Coliseum. <laughs> so they didn't have to worry about worshiping their athletes because it, it ended pretty quickly. 
If they were good, they kept going until they weren't pretty good anymore. And then they were done. You know who was celebrated in Paul's day? People who were wise. People who thought before they spoke. People who took time to be still. So Paul says this, therefore, do not be foolish, but rather understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, I hear people all the time say, what's the will of God? It's kind of like that Easter egg hunt, right? And you're like looking around and you're, you're looking for Easter eggs. Don't lie to me. You're excited about the Easter egg hunt more than your kids are. I can't wait for next Sunday. 2,000 eggs on the lawn. It's going to be so fun. And we don't have to tear down next Sunday. So if you're watching this video online and you skipped church because you didn't want to break down, shame on you. And also, you don't have to tear down next week so you can come. Because we're going to go on the lawn, we're just big Easter egg hunt, but I feel like the will of the Lord, some of us think it's elusive. Some of us think it's like God's hiding his will from us. What is the will of the Lord? Should I buy the house? Should I not? Should I marry her? Should I not? We, we wrestle with what is the will of the Lord. And I think sometimes we, we kind of mess around with the minutia of everything. And we don't sit up in, in the 10,000, 40,000 foot view that God's called us to. What is the will of God? That he would be glorified. There's the biggest thing. That he would be glorified and that his creation would function the way in which he created it to do. Which means that we would find joy in him. That's the will of God. So if you can find joy in God by being a plumber, be a plumber. You know why I'm a pastor? Because I feel like there's nothing else I could do in this world that would bring me more joy and bring God more glory than in this specific capacity. That's why I'm a pastor. That's it. If there was something else, you know what I would interpret that as? The will of God. That he would use my joy, that he would use the way he created me to bring him glory. That's it. And then finally, you know the will of God? That there'd be more people on the right side of the cross. That's the will of God. Why does God want us to live like the light at Vintage Grace so that people living in darkness get exposed and recognize that they're settling for lesser joy? Are they bad, evil people? Well, they're no worse than me. They're sinners that need to be saved by grace. And the way in which they're saved is when they see it in us and in Tony and Cameron Park and in Lake Forest. It's not Lake Forest. At Jackson. I pray they see it at Lake Forest too if your kids go there, by the way. This is the heart of Paul. Walk not as fools, but with understanding. And it starts with thinking rightly. It starts with understanding who God is. It starts with people fighting Jesus, which is the theme of all next week. If you've heard us talk about the pray watch list, come back next week. We're going to pull that apart for you. And then he gives us the third command, and it's this. Do not be drunk, but be filled. The text reads like this. Therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. Now, why would we have a tendency, and for those of you, I, I can hear you gentlemen right now, you're going to go home and say, he said wine, not beer. <laughs> I hear you. Why does Paul say this? You've got to read the whole context here. He cares about the way we live our life. Our actions matter. Why do people drink too much? Because the days are evil. Now, that's why we drink too much. Because we're depressed because we watch GMA. So it starts at 9 a.m. for some people, right? Because the days are evil and we're trying to cope and we're trying to be innocent and we want to go back to the good old days when we were in kindergarten and there was nap time. Can I get an amen to that one at least? So this is Paul's point here. Don't be drunk. Don't be unwise. Don't be foolish. And drunkenness is foolish. He literally calls it a debauchery. Typically what would happen is you would drink too much and you would go into all sorts of sexual activities and it was this big party. And here's what Paul says. That's lesser joy. That's not the gospel. That's not the goodness of God. That will leave you wanting more and probably sick. Paul says, and do not get drunk with wine or beer or anything else, for that is debauchery. And, and I'll let you know, it's the opposite of singing songs like I surrender all. Because what you're doing when you get drunk is you're surrendering the right to your emotions to this substance instead of surrendering your life to Christ. It's the opposite of the gospel. It's the opposite of loving Jesus. It's all about evil days and it's all about robbing your joy. Now, people ask me all the time, do we have an alcohol policy at Vintage Grace? And we actually do. We don't have very many policies. We have an alcohol policy, just so you know. Two things. We will never buy alcohol with Vintage Grace money, ever. I don't think alcohol is of the devil. I just think the devil uses it. But we'll never buy alcohol with Vintage Grace money. 
Because as you give money, it's all going towards the gospel. I'm not saying alcohol is not a part of the gospel. We can have this conversation another day. I've had very many evangelistic beers with people. But we'll never buy alcohol church money and we'll never have it on our campus. So if you're like, man, I, I brew alcohol. I'd love to bring you a beer. Don't bring it to the office. Bring it to my house. <laughs> I didn't mean that to be funny. I just, that was sincere. But this text isn't even about alcohol in the sense of should we or should we not. That's not even what the text is about. The text is actually about the effects of alcohol on our life. Like all these actions, that's what the text is about. The text isn't should we drink or should we not drink. The text is don't get drunk because that's debauchery. Woe to those who rise early in the morning that they might run after strong drink who tarry late into the evening as wine inflames them. That's Isaiah 5. The text is about the young man in my office recently that said, Drew, I'm an alcoholic. It controls everything. I wake up in the morning and I think about making money and it's not about the money, it's about having a drink after work. That's what the point of the text is. And Paul is contrasting that motivation and that way of life with the gospel. That's what he's contrasting. When you woke up this morning, were you fired up for the gospel? That's the contrast here. In the same way that the drunkard is fired up for alcohol, are we fired up for Jesus? I don't mean fake, I don't mean insincere, but are we sincerely pumped about the opportunity that we have to live and to walk with Jesus? With our kids, in our neighborhoods, on our little league teams. Jen and I talk about this all the time. On vacation, do you end up sleeping in a lot? I don't, you know why? Because I'm on vacation. I want to invest in my family. I want to invest in my friends. I want to go hang out and play golf. <laughs> Things I don't get to do during work. I'm on vacation. And yet in the mornings, how many of you guys wake up and you're like, oh, crap. Another day. Am I the only one sometimes? You guys are making me feel really lame right now. Thank you, Sue. See, the point is in the gospel, I would encourage us to think rightly that every day is vacation because every day is an opportunity to walk with Jesus. And as you stumble upon, across these Easter eggs to understand what my God have for me in this moment at this time because the days are evil and I'm not going to be wasteful. So Paul says to the drunkard, don't be drunk. And he says to the sober man, be drunk like he is, but in Jesus and not in alcohol. He says this, do not get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a contrast here is what he's saying. I want you to imagine right now, now I didn't bring a six pack this morning because of the policy that I just told you about. But imagine if I started drinking at the beginning of the sermon. What would start to happen? It depends how long the sermon is, I understand. What would start to happen? I'd start to slur my speech a little bit. Paul talked about speech in chapter four. I'd start to walk maybe a little funny. I don't think that's ironic. I think that's Paul's point here. The way we walk and we live matters. Bless you. Paul's calling us to not be foolish, to be wise, and to live a life on one level of full surrender. And if I started drinking throughout the message, you would notice a difference. You would smell a difference. The question is, when I walk in Starbucks, can they smell the Holy Spirit on me? Literally and metaphorically. Can they tell that I've been in your presence is the question that Paul's asking. Can they tell as we leave church on Sunday morning that we are full so that we can go give and live like Jesus? So that we can do more give love bags. So that we can have more conversations. So we can be present when God gives us opportunities. And I want to hammer this point home. Pun is fully intended here. Here's the point. Don't be drunk with wine, for that's foolish and debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. All believers are filled with the Holy Spirit. At baptism, when they come to faith, they are baptized with the Holy Spirit. Here's what Acts chapter 2 says this, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house in the upper room where they were sitting, and the divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages and tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Here's Paul's point. When we come to faith, 
we are baptized with the Holy Spirit. It's a one-time event that we're given. I'm not saying speaking in tongues is a part of that baptism experience. It was here. I'm not saying it's not either. I'm saying it's not here. That's not Paul's point. Paul's point is that we're filled, and the way in which that filling looked was these people praising God. That's what it looked like. To the point where verse 13, later in that chapter, says this. People were mocking them, saying, they are filled with new wine. Where is it? Where can I get some of that? See, that's the point of being the light in the world, is people look and they say, what is in that person? What is going on with them? What's going on when they live with the flames all around them and marriage is falling apart and life is in chaos? What's going on? And this is why we must be people that are being filled. But the way in which Paul says it, specifically in Ephesians, is this. He says that we must be being kept filled. I'm gonna say that again because you English prof professors are ticked at me right now. The verb pleru is this way. It says that we must be being kept filled. We're baptized once. The Holy Spirit is in us. We are sealed with the Spirit. He talked about that in chapter one and two. But actually, we're continually needing to be filled. You know why we need to be filled, church? Because we leak. Because we're tempted to go back to those, those old clothes and we need to be filled to know that that's rubbish. Hopefully, we leak in a positive sense on people. But in a negative sense, we need to continue to be filled. This involves day by day, moment by moment, submission to the control of the Spirit. The word is a passive word when he says be filled because someone else does it to you. That's important, church. Someone does it to you. It's the control of the Spirit. It's not something that we do that we allow us to be done in us. That's really the, the, the intent here. The present aspect of the words mean that we cannot rely on past fillings, but rather that it's something that we need currently today. The strength of a good marriage is not how good your honeymoon was, church. Date your wife today. Be filled today. It's not on the love that they once had or even the love that they hope to have in the future. It's based on the love and devotion which they have for each other today. That's the intent of what Paul's saying here. Paul's saying, church, don't be drunk with wine because that controls you. Actually be controlled by the Spirit of God and be filled in such a way that you live and love and look and smell and act and walk like the living proof of a loving God. Can we do that? Is that crazy? You pagan? You sinner? And I'm talking to myself right now. This is why I love to preach because I'm convicted constantly. You don't know how sinful I am. And I see Paul say, no, Drew, you can be an imitator of Christ. You can be filled with the Spirit. I'm like, really? Paul, you don't know me. You should talk to my wife. But Paul says, no, no, there's hope for you. And in fact, you should be seeing some of those changes today. You should be watching, walking in such a way and you recognize in your life that there is hope, that there is a future, and that people will one day look at you and say, wow, there's something different. Now, we don't have time because of brevity to deal with these texts, but I encourage you, if you want to wrestle with what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit, go to 1 Corinthians 2, Romans 8, and Galatians 3. Here's the point that Paul's making. You need to think rightly. You need to fill yourself with the things of God, which starts with his word. You need to fill yourself with that so that you might actually know him. One commentator says it this way. He says, raise your sails. Literally, the term to be filled is this idea of raising your sails. I I've never sailed in my life, but when you're sailing a ship, what goes into the sails? Okay, this isn't supposed to be calculus. What goes in the sails? Wind. That's what moves us. In the same way, Paul says this, what moves us as Christians is actually the Spirit of God. He says, raise your sails. He says, be filled, which involves confession of sin, surrendering of will, intellect, body, time, talent, treasure, desires, death of self. John the Baptist, I think, said it best, less of me, more of you. One commentator said this, to be filled would involve living a life in the consciousness of the personal presence of the Lord Jesus Christ as if we were standing next to him and to let his mind dominate my life. To fill ourselves with God's word so that his thoughts are actually my thoughts, that his standards are my standards, that his work is my work and that his will is my will and we yield to the truth of Christ, the Holy Spirit will then lead us to say, do and be what God wants us to say, do and be. Christ consciousness leads to Christ likeness. 
Brothers, sisters, if we're not waking up every morning and say, God, what do you have for me? And oh, by the way, fill me. Then we're saying the wrong thing in the morning. Then we're missing the boat. And this morning, Paul says, pay attention. Don't settle for less. Remember, walking involves how many steps at a time? One. So let's start this morning. Let's start this morning taking one step at a time, being filled with the Spirit, because if we do, here's what's going to happen. We're going to start to sing songs to each other. I love this. We're going to start to sing to each other. How many of you guys are tone deaf? Don't be on the worship band, but sing loud out here. <laughs> Our sound guys, some of them, they, they want to have it loud enough where everyone could sing and not hear the person next to them. But you know why we sing at church? Because the goodness and the glory of God can't just be explained in words. I think sometimes it requires us to belt it out. It requires us to sing. And I don't care if you can't sing, God gave you a voice, use it. Here's what he says, addressing one another, each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, all sorts of diversity, and singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. What happens when our sails are raised is we start to overflow in the goodness of God towards each other and towards God. We start to tell people how thankful we are. We start to live gratitude instead of selfishness. We start to live like Christ and we sing loud. The second thing that happens is we give thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because we understand that we were dead and now we're alive and we are so dang excited. One person is. We sing, we celebrate and the third thing is towards each other we submit and that's the series we're gonna start right after Easter. What's it look like in my marriage? What's it look like with my kids? What's it look like in the workplace? You want me to submit to my boss? You don't know my boss. No, but Jesus does. And he calls us to be the living proof of loving God so that your boss would find Jesus. This is what starts to happen when we raise our sails. Church, can we do this? Oh, here's what I love even more than your response. I'm seeing it. And you know where it starts? It starts at the cross. It starts at the cross. It starts with us remembering the crown that Jesus wore for us. It starts with us remembering the love in which he has for us. So we're going to start this morning as we go raise our sails at lunch, at Little League, all over the place. We're going to go to the cross this morning. And the reason being is simply this, to remember what God has done for us so that we can know what God wants to do, not just in us and not just to us, but through us. Church, God hasn't just rescued you. He's rescued you to rescue others. So I, I need three people right now. Can I get three volunteers? Thank you. Eric, come right up here. Anybody else? Craig right here. I need two in the back. B in the back. One more in the back. Cool. Chris, just come right around. They're going to serve communion right now. And we're going to take some time. And many of us need to take off the old self. He crept back in this week at Little League. We need to take him off and say, Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for ransoming me. And you're going to go take communion. And these four people, if you're the first person in line, they're going to say this. His body is broken for you. His blood is shed for you because you needed to be ransomed and Jesus paid it all. After they serve you communion, here's what I'm asking you to do, church. This is my favorite way to do communion. It'll make some of you uncomfortable. I'm okay with that. It's never bothered me. I'm gonna ask you to switch spots and the next person behind you is gonna come and now you are gonna say that same blessing to them. His body is broken for you. His blood is shed for you. Why? Because we as the church need to sing songs to each other. We need to bless each other. We need to remind each other. Delna, you are loved. Rebecca, God loves you more than you even know. And may these words, as someone says them to you, may you receive that. And then I don't want you to be robbed of the joy of actually blessing somebody else and saying that to them. So it takes some coordination. I know this is a high calling, high standard. You need to come and receive. And then part of this is the gospel. What God does to you, he also wants to do through you. So I want you to spin and be ready to serve the next person. And then you're going to spin and then the next person. Father God, thank you for the cross. Thank you for the fact that we can be filled with your spirit. That me, Drew, sinner saved by grace. That when you see me, you see your son. Because your body was broken for me and your blood was shed for me. And Spirit of God, I do pray for a filling for each of us. I pray that we don't rest on past fillings. I pray that we continue to ask. I pray that we know that we are sealed and we are forever yours. But I pray that as we come before you this morning, we receive the goodness 
of your life so that then we can live your life for others. And all of his people said, amen.